it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hey, this is Luke Griggs, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Steve. And Steve comes to us from Kentucky. His encounter took place over 40 years ago. This is back in 1977. Steve was 10 years old, and he was actually out there. He, he came ver- within a very close distance of this creature. And pay close attention to the creature's behavior and how it kind of reacts to Steve sitting there. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Steve to the show. Steve, thanks for coming on. Hey, you're welcome. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here, Steve. And I know your encounter again took place back in 1977. Uh, You were about 10 years old, and I'm fascinated by your account. If you would, would you just kind of start from the very beginning, kind of tell us what you were doing, and take us back to that moment. What happened? Yeah, sure will. Um, So like you said, it was 1977. Um, I was 10 years old. It was a weekend. My dad had came home and, uh, he had a guy that he worked with who had a son that was almost exact same age as I was. Anyway, our dads was buddies and worked together. They wanted to take us to their family property to go do some, what we, we called it stream fishing. Some people called it a stream. Some people called it a small river, um, real nice shale spring fed river um you know lots of sandbars very clear clean water so uh anyway this would have been uh this would have been friday night the first night we set up camp on a sandbar we'd been fishing all day and just had a real good day of fishing so we'd set up on a sandbar and we had two tents me and my dad in one tent him and his dad in the other me and the boy had ate a lot of s'mores and um so uh needless to say four or five hours later which would have been about 3 a.m i just my stomach was tearing me up so i just got out of the tent i went over and sat in one of the chairs and i was grabbing some smaller stuff to put on the fire it would had basically died down and uh, so I threw some smaller stuff on it, and it was just starting to light up a little bit, and I could start seeing. And um, <clears throat> I started hearing 
the best way I can describe it is imagine if you were walking in water that was all oh, about knee high and you was trying to be fairly quiet, but every time you step, you, you, you kind of get a, a swish, swish, swish. So I start hearing this and that's the first thing that popped in my mind. I was like, well, what is that sound? You know, next thing I know, there he comes. It's, it's right in front of me, you know, I'm sitting here with my jaw hung open and, uh, it's still standing in the water and it walks right over to where we have two different fish baskets. One fish basket is a round pan fish wire mesh basket. Like you could buy at Walmart or anywhere. And then the second trap, uh, the second basket was a live trap, a humane trap. Like you would catch a possum or raccoon in and go turn them loose somewhere else. But we had turned it into a, 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 a fish cage for catfish because it was about three foot long and about a foot by foot square. So it reaches down, pulls up the round basket, the one with the panfish in it, sets it down, back down in the water, turns his head, kind of looks at me, picks up the second one, looks at the basket, looks back at me, and turns around and starts walking back out the water. I can hear the sound leaving, and I don't know what happened. But the thing that got me was, and I'm not saying this is, you know, mind speak or any, anything like that, but I just got this feeling when he held that second basket up and he looked at me, it was like, um, hey, I'm taking these fish, please and thank you. And he turns around he starts walking away. And um, so I'm like, just trying to process this all. I, I wasn't scared. I didn't feel threatened in any way. But I was still 10 years old. So I go back to the tent, and I go back in there and lay down. So uh, we get up about two or three hours later. I, I didn't go to sleep. I just kind of laid there. And so uh, so my dad got up, and uh, I told him what had happened. And he told me not to tell anybody, not to tell the boy or his dad, and that he wanted to talk to me about it when we got home before I said anything. So anyway, the, the boy goes over and he says, Hey, we're missing a fish basket. And so my dad chimes right in and he says, Hey, uh, you know, it's, it's probably one of them big snapping turtles we've been seeing around here. They probably come up and latched onto it and drug it out into one of the deep holes and trying to, you know, get in there and get the fish. So, you know, that was that. So when we got home, my dad asked me, he says, uh, so what happened? And I told him, I, I said, I seen a caveman. And so he said, a caveman, he kind of chuckles a little bit, you know, kind of like he wasn't expecting to hear that. You know, my dad was not, he, he, he was, he was a good dad. So, uh, he was listening to me. See, he said, his eyes got all big. He says, son, you seen a Bigfoot." I said, oh no. I said, it's, it's not a big foot. It was a caveman. And so anyway, so he was like, yeah, well, I think they're the same thing. Well, like I, like I had talked to you earlier and said, you know, I was born in 1967. Um, so I grew up with, I guess, what's known as the Patterson-Gimlin film. And that thing on the Patterson-Gimlin film looked way more apish, I guess I could say, than what I seen. What I seen looked like that uh, Sykesville monster. And I had looked that up. I thought that was in Kentucky, but that was in Maryland, that Sykesville uh, monster sighting. I've seen that picture on a website, and that is uh, really, really close to, uh, to what I've seen. Uh, like I said, this thing had a little bit of a neck. Um, it wasn't just like a bowling ball sitting on top of a refrigerator, so to speak. But it was large. Um, it was kind of hunched over a little bit. Uh, did have kind of long arms. And it was hairy. But it wasn't um, like a real thick fur or hair like, say, like a bear would have. But, uh, oh, 
and it had its eyes. It had eyes like a human. It had white, but I don't remember seeing a, a pupil, but I remember it being very brown. But I do remember it having white out around it. It wasn't like a black beady-eyed rat, so to speak, you know? I appreciate you describing it. You know, I know we're going back over 40 years ago, and uh, I'll, I'll post a picture of the Sykesville monster so people know what we're talking about uh, underneath this episode on SasquatchChronicles.com. One thing that I noticed is you kept saying he. What what made you think it was a male? Um, it was a male. I I did see that um, pretty plainly. <laughs> it was that far out of the water anyway. Um, you know, it was – I was kind of – just focused on the the upper chest and the shoulders and the head but like i said i mean i did plainly see that it it was a male yes you know steve i interview a lot of kids off the air and uh, their parents will put them on the phone they'll describe what they saw and, and one thing that's very common is most kids don't freak out when they run into these creatures uh, they they just don't have the the fear i think that most uh, adults have when they run into these creatures. Um, what what was kind of going through your mind? I mean, what did you think as this thing was kind of walking in your general direction, coming up, taking your fish? What was kind of going through your mind at that moment? Wes, I tell you, um, just about the best way I can explain it was it looked like what we've been taught a caveman or Neanderthal. One of you know, it, it looked like something like that. I mean, it just, it did not look. I mean, and I call it a he, and I don't call it an it for a reason because what I was looking at, it seemed like it was very smart. You know, everything was uh, that it did was was very intentional, very graceful. I mean, it was just. Uh, it was a very smooth running machine, and uh, um, I just thought of a caveman. I mean, that was the only thing I could think of. And, and you know, and, and I, like I said, I had seen the Patterson Gimlin film, and it just didn't look anything like that. That's what I considered a Bigfoot to look like. That's why my dad was telling me, he's like, no, that's a Bigfoot. I said, no, it was a caveman. You know? So after he talked to me a little bit, you know, we got it figured out, and I was like, oh, okay. I mean, I just thought it was a caveman, and, and I think maybe since I was a child that it knew I wasn't going to do anything or try anything. If if that happened to me uh, this next weekend, I'd probably uh, die of a heart attack, you know? <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I think most of the time the reaction of a child versus the reaction of an adult uh, are vastly different when they run into these creatures. Um, how far away from you was a creature? I'm saying 20 feet because, and again, this was just a guessment uh, from my dad because when we was coming down the creek, he says, hey, he says, that sandbar has got to be 50 foot wide, you know, and then I was just kind of judging by where we was at. I would say at 10 years old, it was probably eight to 10 good strides of my stride from me. I mean, it, 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 it was close. I mean, it, you know, like, uh, I mean, dude, I, I could see the water dripping off this thing. I could hear it breathing. I was just kind of freaked out, you know? I mean, and then after it, it, it turned around and it departed, um, just as, as easy, you know, as, as it came in, it dawned on me. We haven't touched those fish baskets since about eight o'clock the night before. So that's pushing seven hours. So this thing has been watching us because it knew where the fish baskets were. These fish baskets don't stick up out of the water. They got a rope tied onto them and a big, big piece of stick stuck in the ground with the rope tied onto it. They're two or three feet out into the water. You can't see these. You don't know what they are. So that's what I was like. This thing's had to be watching us. Yeah, I agree with you, Steve. I, I mean, it sounds like it, it, it must have been watching you guys all day long. Uh, because it knew it knew where the fish were, and it and the fact that it was very direct coming up and and grabbing them, it must have watched you guys put them 
in that thing all day long and just waited for an opportune time. How, how deep do you think the water is where it crossed? Um, the next day, like I said, these was all real nice shale and limestone creeks and rivers. Very, very clean water. Most of it was spring fed. So it being in the low 90s during the day, um, you get one of those little holes out there that's 10 or 12 foot deep. Man, that water's 60 degrees, you know? So it's like you could cool off quick. But uh, the place we was at, that's what we did, me and the boy, the next day. Um, so I went out just for my own little experiment and uh, did, did the breath hold and did the dolphin flip and went head down. And I probably got about one or two kicks and where I was touching the bottom. And I'd say my feet was you know, right at the top of the water. So I'm going to say five feet, maybe, you know, five and a half max, I would say, you know, something like that at that age. I can't remember how tall I was, but I know I was always a big kid. But so anyway, where it was standing at was almost, was up almost to the bottom of the top of my belly. And this thing here, it was just below its knees. You know, like I said, I could, see it was a male so you know he's he, he was definitely a lot taller than i was so i'm really fascinated by your account it, it, you know the creature really didn't seem to show you any sort of aggression or trying to do any sort of display as you sat there did the expression on the face change it, it had a um a very big mouth and what i mean by that is is when its mouth was closed and its lips was together normally the mouth slit went way back on the side of his i mean like not back to his ears but he had a real why uh you know like like he could open his mouth up really wide so i don't know it it's i swear it looked at me and kind of cracked a grin out of one side you know kind of like a like like somebody's looking at you like yeah gotcha gave you a grin and a little nod you know like, gotcha you know, but, uh, there was no nod or anything like that. But, but like I said, I could have swore for a split second. I kind of, you know, and it could have just did some kind of little facial thing and not know it or whatever. But, uh, but no, it, it was, uh, it came up, uh, when it came up, it looked at me and it looked down at both the baskets and it, when it picked the wrong basket up, it looked at me and then without even looking, it reached over and grabbed the other rope. Cause it knew that was the one that it wanted, you know, when he picked it up looks at it kind of like a, Hey, thank you. And he turns around and walks out. Yeah. A lot of eyewitnesses say that it looked very human like, and a lot of times when I ask him about, uh, the expressions on the face, a lot of them will say it was very, very much like, like looking at a human, whether it's mad, angry, curious, surprised, uh, they seem to have very human like, uh, expressions. And for the audience, I'll post a picture of the Sykesville monster, uh, that Steve is talking about. And Steve, you're right. It, it does look very, it's kind of an artist rendition uh, of what the Sykesville monster looked like, but it does look like a caveman. I mean, what you would imagine a caveman would look like. Um, I, I'm very curious about your dad's reaction. Do you think that your dad actually had seen the creature before? If he had, he never said nothing to me about it. I know that he said that he's seen a, a UFO one time and he didn't think those existed until he seen one. So his, you know, his thing was, well, why couldn't there be a Bigfoot, you know, or a Sasquatch or, you know, whatever you'd like to call it. And so that was just kind of his take on it. And, uh, I mean, that was my dad. He knew me better than anybody. We was kind of raised Southern style. I guess I'll say, you know, uh, you didn't back talk your parents, you know, uh, you know what I'm saying? We, we kind of grew up strict. So I knew not to lie. <laughs> and, uh, and he knew that I knew that. So, uh, you know, and, and plus I think he could tell, I was kind of like now I, I got all excited and started just rattling stuff off. And he looks at me, he says, but boy, you got to slow down, you know? So then anyway, we, we got to talking and he was like, well, there, maybe there's more than one kind of it since that one was way out there. Maybe it looks different. And so, uh, uh, I know my dad was kind of torn about wanting to say something or ask this guy, his buddy, because that was his family's land. 
I don't know if he ever did, but I know that he wanted to, but I, I just don't know if he wanted to bring me into it or not, you know, and then say, Hey, yeah, well we didn't say nothing. And then the guy get upset or something, you know? Yeah. I really like the way your dad handled the whole situation and kind of his reaction to you. You know, he didn't put you on the spot, didn't try and embarrass you. Uh, you know, he believed you and he said, Hey, let's talk about it another time when we're away from everyone. Um, I, I like the way he handled that. One of the questions I wanted to ask you is, do you think the creature actually knew you were there when it came up to take the fish? Or do you think it was in the middle of stealing the fish and then it noticed you were there? Well, and this is just all you know, speculation, of course. I think it was already in the water and headed our way when I got out of the tent because it was quiet and everybody was asleep. Well, like I said, it was maybe 10 minutes after the time I got out that I had a pretty good fire going because I'd grabbed some small stuff and threw it. So I think basically that it was probably partially the way there. And it was like, holy crap, the fire's going to be, Oh man, there's somebody out there, you know, because see the tent would have been the way he came. I was sitting on the other side of the tent, but still facing the river. So that tent would have been blocking me. But at the same time, I'm sure he had to see the, the fire get bigger, you know? And I think he was like, oh, well, you know, and I think he just kind of came on up and probably seen it was a kid, you know, did his thing. Yeah, he could have took both of them. I, I was good with it. Yeah, I probably would have reacted the same way. Let it, You know, let him have it. You know, if that's what he wants and he's going to go away, let him take it. Uh, fish another day. Um, you know, I know that you actually had a strange encounter uh, when you were getting out of the service or you're on leave and you're in Montana. Um, do you mind telling us about that? When, when did this happen? So uh, this was uh, about 1988. I was approximately 20 years old. I was in service and I had a buddy of mine that was uh, there with me. And he was from Missoula, Montana. And I'd never been out that way before. So we decided both to take leave at the same time. And we drove out there back to his house. One of the things that my buddy and his two brothers and their dad did was this big hike. It was like 13 miles up this, up into this mountain. You know, I mean, not 13 miles straight up, but from where you had to park and then where you got up to the crater lake, it was 13 miles. Really, really rugged. A lot of really big rocks and boulders and and uh, down trees, just, I guess, from storms and stuff like that. So, uh, plus you had a big pack on. And, and uh, uh, so anyway, we're down there at the truck. And we was just getting ready to take off. And he starts handing out everybody long guns and handguns and stuff. I look, <laughs> I was like, man, you got what are you guys doing? I thought we was going hiking, you know? And he's like, oh, yeah, man, well, there's, there's, you know, grizzlies up here. It's the uh, Sawtooth Mountains, you know? And he said, there's grizzlies up here and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, I was like, well, all right. So uh, anyway, we've all, uh, I had a 308 and uh, a 44 Ruger revolver. And then, like I said, I don't know what him and his boys had. But uh, anyway, we, we was armed, you know? So anyway, we're, we're going up there and, uh, you start getting up in the elevation and stuff, even just a little bit, you know, it can really kick your ass. So we'd stop and take water breaks about every 30 minutes at this point because we'd been in it for a while. So we get up, and, of course, my my buddy's dad, he was always lead man. So he gets up, everybody gets packs on, we take about two or three steps, and he, he does this move. He's in mid-step, and he does this move. It's almost like some kind of, Oh, a, a weird dance move. He kind of like does this little hop and he lands with one foot out in front of the other and he's pointing. And I mean, you could tell the guy just seen something. Right. So anyway, and he was like, it, I don't want to say my buddy's name, but anyway, he was like coming your way. So we, he grabs hold of me and we take off running and we probably run about, oh, maybe 20 or 30 yards. All I see is the butt of this thing. And it's in the bush, maybe a second, like a, a split second. But what I could see 
was this thing was very muscular, very, very thick. Uh, I don't know how else to say this, but it had a huge ass and huge thighs. And so anyway, uh, see, I thought it was a bear because of kind of the way it was built and the size of it. And I just caught a fleeting gl glimpse. But my buddy's dad said that it was a Sasquatch and that it was watching us. And when we got up and took our first couple steps, it booked. And he said by the time it had went like three or four steps, it went down on all fours. That's why it went in disappeared in the bush like it did at that kind of an angle, you know, instead of being upright, it was down with its, its butt stuck out, you know what I mean? But I just remember that I was like, Jesus, those are the biggest butt cheeks I've ever seen, you know, I mean, just, and muscle, you know, you could just tell it was muscle, but that's what happened in Montana. I'm pretty sure my buddy's dad, he was born and raised there. Then boys did that hike every year. I mean, my buddy went home on leave for that. You know what I mean? So that was religion. And, and this guy done this stuff a lot after he retired. So, I mean, he knows the difference between a bear and a moose. And, I mean, them lifelong hunters from up in there, man, they they know what the hell they're looking at. It don't matter if they're college educated or not. You know, you can still see. Yeah, I hear you. I think when you're describing a bear and you say butt cheeks, it's probably not a bear. You know, they might have a wide a wide end to them, but I don't know that I would say butt cheeks. Your, your buddy's dad was probably right. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, it was, I mean, it was covering some ground. I do know that. And I do know that bears can cover ground. And, and I've seen some black bears out in the wild and stuff, actually. And they may be able to cover ground, but they're... they're they're not fluid, you know, they're not, um, their, their movements aren't fluid. You know, like I said, like I said, this thing here, you could, you could tell it was, it was getting with the program. Yeah. When a black bear runs off, it's more of a lumbering motion. They're fast. Don't get me wrong, but it's more of a, a lumbering motion. When, when you saw this, did you have any sort of flashbacks to when you were 10? Like, Oh, I've, I've seen this before. Um, well, not actually when I seen it. Because, like I said, I, I thought it was a bear because it was a uh, kind of like a, 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 a light brown colored or maybe a reddish colored, you know, like you would think of like a normal, like if you think about a grizzly bear, you know, they're kind of, they're not black, you know what I mean, most of them. So it was that kind of a color. But then, like, when my buddy's dad came over there, I mean, man, he was, he was fired up. He was kind of an adrenaline guy anyway. But uh, he was super fired up, and uh, you know, like I said, then my 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 buddy, you know, and he was like, "Man, he's like that's the closest I've ever came." He said, "Dad's seen him four or five times. Had him come in, come into his camp once up there. To there was a big lake up at the top where we went, and we'd go up there and trout fish. Uh, nothing of any size, but every cast, man, good time. So so you know, he said uh, they came in there one night on him." didn't bother him just went through some stuff i guess but but he's seen him several times but anyway there, there's pretty much no doubt in my mind that 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 guy knew what the heck he was looking at yeah it sounds like you know he's run into them before and i could see how you know beyond being surprised or startled you know that you didn't really react to it thinking it was a bear um it, it's fascinating it would be nice to chat with with the dad find out what he's seen and what he knows. I know you had, in 1994, you were in Indiana in Morgan Monroe State Park. Uh, were you guys hunting out there? Uh, yes. Yeah, we was, uh, we was turkey hunting. Uh, like you said, this is about 1994, and I was about 25 years old. My family owns some land in, I guess you could kind of call it southern Indiana, south central Indiana. And it borders the Morgan Monroe National Forest. It's a really a gem of a little place. It's uh, kind of almost like a little rainforest. I mean, uh, uh, you can drive around in there for miles on a bright and sunny day, high noon, and you will not see the sun hitting the ground, like I said, for miles. It's uh, old growth, um, lots of ferns, lots of uh, wet, lushy type stuff there. So anyway... Uh, me and a friend of mine decided we was going to go turkey hunting. 
And uh, we usually went to a different spot, but he wanted to go to this one particular spot. So anyway, he's a big-time archery hunter, and he likes to hunt everything with a bow. We got set up in a couple different spots. And, of course, since he was shooting a bow, I didn't hear him shoot, you know. Uh, he comes walking over, and he says, hey, he says, he says, I shot one. And I said, all right. I said, well, let's give it a minute. So anyway, we kind of sit there, and, and it was one of them things like you hear and hear, you know. It was just all of a sudden I just kind of got this chill, and I was just like, huh. And so anyway, I noticed he starts looking around. I said, you all right? And he says, man, I just got this feeling like we're being watched. I was like, man, that's crazy. I did too. I was like, just, just a minute ago. He said, me too. So anyway, he said, well, well let's go find this bird. So uh, anyway, we take off and we start tracking it. And most time when you're tracking a turkey, you don't find much blood because the turkey doesn't have much blood. You're finding feathers and stuff like that. You know, it's kind of how you kind of see where it's going. So anyway, he says, well, he says, I've seen it run over this way. And he was pointing kind of over to his right. Well, so anyway, we go over there. Well, then we start seeing feathers going up this little hill. There was a big, huge oak tree. I mean, who knows how many hundreds of years this thing, old this thing was. It was massive. The trail went up, and you hooked right around a little U-turn right around this oak tree, and you went on up a hill and then down a hill. So anyway, we're sitting there, and we're following all these feathers. I just... I'm just creeped out. My buddy walks around the tree, gets up on top of the hill, and he's looking down. You can see for probably about, oh, 30 or 40 yards. He was like, oh, man. He says, come up here and check this out. I said, cool, dead turkey. He says, no, come check this out. So he goes up there, and there's, like I said, there were some little feathers, and these feathers was kind of looked like they was just leading down this trail. And so I was like, oh, you know, I was like, all right, yeah, I see the feathers. He's like, no. He said, look where we're at. He says, we need to do this. And I said, do what? And so he starts pointing out to me, um, we've got a couple spots that we bow hunt in East Central Indiana. And we got one spot that's great, but there's so many areas that the deer can come in. <laughs> one time he says, hey, Mother ne- Nature needs to blow the trees down like this. That way we'll block this and then funnel them in. And we can maybe get a shot at him, you know. And uh, so we started laughing anyway. So he says, Remember I was telling you about the trees falling down and, and making a funnel? And uh, as soon as he said that, I was done because we was right in it. We was right at the beginning of this. There had been trees that when you looked at it, they were just laid down with purpose. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just something that fell over. And, you know, they, I say they because I feel like we was being baited to go down there for whatever reason. And uh, that scared the hell out of me, man, when, uh, when I thought of that, you know. And, and, and I had the sixth sense going the whole time. You know, I was on edge, and I wasn't the only one he felt it to. Um, but when he said that, I was like, you know, I, just, I basically grabbed his arm, and I was like, come on, let's get the hell out of here, you know. So we take off. We're going back down its trail. Again, the big oak tree. This time we hook around to the left because it's like a switch back around this oak tree to go down this trail. So we get down this trail, and we're basically right below where we were just standing. And my buddy stops me. He says, did you hear that? And I was like, oh, shit. Hear what? You know, <laughs> I didn't want to hear nothing. I just wanted to get out of there. He said, man, I just heard something that sounded like a child. And I said, a child, like, talking? He said, no. He said, it sounded like a cry. And then it did it again, and I heard it this time. But it was very, very faint. Very faint. And I was told, I, man, I pushed, he was in front of me. I pushed him. I said, you get your hind in down this trail. We are out of here. And, of course, you know, he was like, well, hey, man, there could be somebody hurt up there. I was like, man, just go, you know. So we got down to the bottom, and I just kind of laid it out to him like I did you. You know, and I told him what was going on. I said, man, there's something trying to get us up down in there. I'm telling you. That scared the hell out of me, and that that kind of changed things on what I think about Bigfoot and Sasquatch. I mean, I definitely, like like the one I seen may have been very, very human looking. But, man, who who knows how, how it acts? It could act It could act just like some savage animal. I mean, I think maybe this, some animals... When they see a child or something small, they think of prey. You know, they get that prey drive going. And then I think some of them's kind of like, hey, 
this guy ain't gonna mess with me. He's just a child. Yeah, it could be. It could be that they don't see children as a threat. I still don't trust them one bit around kids or anyone else for that matter. Um, you know, the the hearing the children crying or children laughing, that gets reported a lot. I've talked to many hunters, hikers, and I'm not sure if it's Sasquatch doing it or not. I mean, it, it seems like when they're around, this sort of thing happens, like they're mimicking a child crying or uh, children playing, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it makes me wonder, you know, what do we do as hunters? We have game calls and we use game calls to lure in our prey. And it makes me wonder if they're doing the same thing. Uh, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, uh, it did not settle with me and it, and it still does not settle with me well at all. That made me, uh, that made me really scared. And, uh, and I'll, I've been in some pretty nasty uh, situations. I mean, you know, I've <laughs> I I got sh I've been shot, I've been stabbed. Uh, you know what I mean? I I've I've had all kinds of crazy stuff happen to me that was life-threatening and and I've been in some really bad situations and and none of this th this was just like a different type uh when you feel like prey, when you feel like you're being hunted, man that that's a whole different game then. I don't care who you are. It scares the hell out of you, or it should. You know, when it's something like that, man, you're what you're so outclassed, dude. You just better hope that that's not what's going on. Yeah, after talking to so many different eyewitnesses, I'm convinced that they hunt this way. Uh, most of their hunting is ambush. You know, bring it down just like we do. Bring it down to the shooting lanes and spook them and drive them that way. And uh, it kind of sounds like it's that type of situation. So. But I don't blame you one bit for it spooking you, uh, but it didn't really stop you from hunting. And I know the last incident, you didn't see the creature, but uh, back in 2017, you were in Kentucky. Uh, do you mind telling us about that? Yeah, this was, uh, this is about, oh man, not very far, maybe 12 miles from where I had my sighting when I was 10 years old. I've got a friend who's a friend of the family. That's why it's so close. Um, anyway, he still owns a bunch of property down there. Uh, sometimes I get really super busy with work, uh, especially seasonal. I was going to Indiana's bow season comes in October 1st. Well, so my boss had gotten a hold of me and told me, he says, Hey, you're going to be busy all through October. If, if you, if you need to get a hunt in, you better do it now. This was the beginning of September. This was about, towards the end of the first week of September. So I called my buddy up and he was like, yeah, our bow season comes in September 1st. I was like, oh, I'm, I got to come down there if I'm going to hunt. And he's like, well, come on, you know? So I go down there. I believe this was the second morning that um, I was walking back there. So um, he lived along another one of these creeks, big creeks. I park up by his barn and it's probably three quarters of a mile walk down a trail along the creek in a kind of a small holler, which is uh, basically a big flat piece of ground between two high ridges. So I get about halfway there. I get down the trail and this trail, you got to go through a ridge on one side and then a river on the other side. So kind of, it's kind of a pinch point there and, if something was waiting on the on the hill, you'd be the game. That'd be where they get you, uh, because there's only I mean it's just a, a natural funnel right there. You're you're either going to the hill or in the drink there, one of the two. Um, so I get about halfway down this lane, and oh, let me point out also that 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 is the only way to get onto the rest of the property. Picture like an hourglass, you know, kind of goes down a little skinny point, then opens back up again. So anyway, I was coming right down to that little pinch point and I hear a straight up plain as day whoop. It was kind of a higher pitched whoop. Just made me think of an adolescent or a female for some reason, I guess because of the, the tone of it. And I stopped where I was and turned around and headed back the other direction. 
and uh, went and ground hunted that morning. <laughs> and uh, so anyways, so I didn't tell you this earlier um, when we had talked this because I was, I was throwing so much at you. Um, but uh, so I was telling you, I shot a real nice doe right after that. She comes walking down the creek. Of course, so I had a nice shot, nice, nice big doe all by herself. And so, uh, so I shot her uh, with bow. And so she turns around and she runs uh, probably about 30 yards to a little sandbar. Lots of sandbars down there in them places up through that area, you know. So she was laying there, and uh, I call my buddy, and he comes and brings his uh, gator, his UTV gator with a big dump bed on the back. So he pulls up on the sandbar, and, and, uh, and, and it's hot down there. I remember it was very hot, and the flies was horrible. They was all over the deer, and I kept trying to shoo them away from the deer. And and then him and one of his buddies is, is, is in this gator, and they're standing out, and they're looking down in the water there, you know. So I'm like, well, hey, come on. Let's get this deer out of here. These flies are biting me, you know, and everything else. He was like, come over here and take us out. And I go over and uh, you can see what looked to me like to be a big, huge heel impression. And, you know, they was like, well, well, what do you think that is? I was like, oh, man, any anything could have made that because it was just right at the edge of the water. And I think, and, you know, maybe it was the power of suggestion, but I think I could see to where the print went on down into the water a little bit, but you could definitely not see any kind of, of toes. They was, had been washed away. I swear I could see a faint outline, you know, of a little bit more than, like up to maybe where our, maybe up where our ball would be, uh, right below your big toe. But whatever it was, was going in the water. So, you know, but anyway, they looked around real quick and we threw that deer up there and we left and, uh, nobody ever said nothing about it, but, uh, I could tell they didn't, they didn't like it. I still never told him that I heard that whoop out there because I know he's got to know, <laughs> that, you know, they at least come through there. I mean, it's just such a perfect place. I mean, it's just, you know. Yeah, it makes me wonder if anyone else heard that whoop that you heard. Um, some of the most fascinating encounters are the people that never see them. I mean, hunters who are hunting a property they own, and they'll shoot something, and then it vanishes. I know you've spent a lifetime out there hunting and fishing and just being outdoors, but was that the only time you ever heard a vocal of something strange that you, you couldn't explain? The only thing <laughs> that I've ever heard was again in the Morgan Monroe, uh, forest down there. Um, I've got a camper, uh, out on the edge of the family property. And I mean, literally, uh, there's a barbed wire fence. So I just hop the fence and we go mushroom hunting or any kind of hunting that we want to do. Um, so anyway, basically one night I was staying in that camper and I heard what sounded to me like somebody that had somebody that was totally drunk out of their gourd trying to imitate a hoodow. And it was just so, and there is a ton of them there. Like I said, that is all I mean, they got the big the big pilated woodpeckers, they got, all, I mean, it's a really a gem of a little place, you know, and uh, tons and tons of hoot owls too. But uh, yeah, because I remember sitting there and I was laughing. I was laughing about it and I was trying to hurry up and get my phone, you know, just to, and I was like, man, you know, I think some of the owls got in our cooler, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, uh, but, but not that I know of other than that, you know, knowing now that I hear their, uh, quite the mimickers you know uh like i said it was it was really really odd so yeah i'm convinced that they mimic uh they can mimic just about anything i've had too many reports too many weird audio files uh sent to me and i do think that they mimic you know and, and it's bizarre their mimic isn't perfect but it's close uh, i think the one uh, ron moorhead said it perfect he said you know what throws off their uh, ability to mimic is the amount of amplitude that comes out, the volume that comes out when they mimic. Uh, you know, it's not an owl or something like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, 
like I said, it, you know, now that I, I, as I've gotten older, I've, I'm really into, um, history, ancient history. Um, I've gotten into folklore and I just, I love the native American stuff that they have to, to say about, the you know, Sasquatch and all the different names and, you know, how some of them, you know, some of them say, Oh gosh, man, they're, they're, they're horrible people eaters, you know? And then the other ones say, Oh, well they take our kids and, and give them herbal remedies and bring them back cured, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, it's just, it's just so odd. I mean, it's, it's no wonder that us current modern people kind of have the same type stories, you know, that some people have really super bad experiences that traumatizes them. Um, man, I've heard some, some people on your show, man, and I felt for them, you know, I mean, you could just tell that, uh, man, they, they may not ever be right again. So I've got a daughter that's an RN and lives in deep South. So I don't get to see him, but about once a year, her and the grandkids. And she's the one that pointed out to me that, you know, I was being very forgetful and, and stuff like that. And, and so, so that's how, kind of how all this came about. And she loves your show. And so she was telling me about it and she was like, Oh my God. She's like, are you kidding me? Who's got a story about Bigfoot coming and stealing their fish? And I was like, well, I guess maybe you're right. And she's like, no, you got it. She's like, people need to know this stuff. That way it's a chapter in the book and we can learn from it. We, we're learning more about what they really do and who they really are instead of just seeing one running across the road or, or something like that. You're learning a personality type thing. You know, you're, you're learning something about that critter. Yeah, you do learn a lot. You know, when, when people like yourself, Steve, come forward and share what happened to them, uh, you learn a lot listening to encounters. You learn descriptions and behaviors and there's a lot to take away and shout out to your daughter for listening to the show. Uh, God bless her, you know, and, and her sending you my way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and like I said, I mean, I, I really had no plans of ever doing anything like this. Um, like I said, I just, my family knew my very, very immediate family, uh, and one of my hunting buddies. And, uh, like I said, he was, he was the one that, uh, you know, he was like, I, it's like I told him, I said, Hey, you know, if, if I come up and I look at you and I, and I tell you something, you're going to believe me. He said, yes, I do. Cause I've known him 45 years, you know? And, uh, he said, I would absolutely believe you take it to the bank, you know? And I said, well, uh, why don't you believe me about this? He said, man, I just got to see it. And I said, man, I get it. You know, I can totally get that. You know, he was the one with me when it had the little baby cry thing stuff going on and, and, and that freaked him out, but he won't attribute he tries to make excuses for it. I could have been a tree cracking and bending, making that weird little squeaking noise. I said, yes, it could have been. But uh, I don't think so because it didn't sound like no tree to me. It did it twice from the same spot, from a spot that I think they was trying to get us to. And that was not cool. That was not cool. I mean, you know, so now I'm a little different in the way I think, I guess, about some of them anyway. Yeah, that encounter definitely sounded like an ambush. I mean, it sounded like it to me. Uh, you know, one question, I know you're kind of a new listener to the show, Steve, and one question I always like to ask everyone, and there's no wrong answer because no one knows, uh, but what do you think that these creatures are? Wow. Um, well, I think they are, as they say, flesh and blood. Like I said, because... I had one standing in front of me with water dripping off of it. I think it's totally physical. I think if they was just just some sort of a, a branch off a hominid or a hominid, you know, if they was just some kind of a simple ape or whatever, we would definitely already have known about them and had them in captivity for years, just like we do every damn, every damn thing else. You know, I think – so I think they're much more than that. And like I said, what I've seen – you know, I'm not even going to call, I don't even want to keep called a critter, but you know, uh, what I seen is, you know, what I seen, it was very manlike. Um, who's to say what they are, you know, everybody's like, well, one day we'll get one. We'll have this man. I'll tell you what, I think they've been, I think the government have been experimenting on these things for years and years, you know, because you hear these stories about people hitting them. You hear these stories about them getting caught in forest fires. 
you know, and finding them and, and just all kinds of stuff like that. You know, oh, well, it disappeared. Well, maybe from you it disappeared, but it went somewhere, you know. And you know what? Maybe these things are so special in a way that we're not that the government is scared to tell us that they exist because there's so much more than what we are in a way. Like I said, what I seen just looked like a classic Neanderthal caveman. And, you know, really, do we even know what a what one of them really looked like? Nope. We just rebuild the skeletons forensically wise and kind of get some kind of a, a of a guesstimate, you know. But uh, I, I think that uh, they've been here a very, very, very long time is what I think. And that's why I think there's no fossil record of them coming over from Asia. I think they've been here the whole time. I think if we're going to find any fossils, it's going to be around here. But, you know, fossils are overrated too, man. There's so many things that's got to be perfect for a fossil to even form. There could be hundreds of man-like creatures that's been on the earth and died out and stuff, and we'll never know because we'll never find their, ske- their skeletons or anything. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of them things just, what was it? I mean, like, uh, I'm trying to think of that day going, uh, what was that movie that was about that gal that, uh, what was it called? E- uh, not Eve, uh, uh, Lucy, uh, that movie called Lucy, you know, like the more, you know, the more she got, she got where she could use so much more of her brain from some kind of a something going wrong with her. But anyway, it made her like super, super smart, you know, man. I mean, she had telekinesis telepathy she could shut people down she could make them sick this all with her mind so who's to say that these bigfoot sasquatch maybe they use a part of their brain that we've forgotten how or never could yeah and i really appreciate your answer steve so you think it's something more natural then i think it's something very natural um but i just like i said i don't want to use supernatural or paranormal or anything like that because uh you know, I think that I think these things just know things about Earth's energy. Um, I just think that they're just like way more in tune with things than what we are. Uh, maybe it's a vibrational thing, you know, like a body vibration thing. Maybe maybe they can change the frequency, you know, of their body. And that's how it kind of looks like maybe they can cloak or some of the stuff like people are seeing. You know, maybe they can, you know, I mean, hell, who knows, right? Nobody. <laughs> so, I mean, but yeah, man, that's my long winded answer. But, um, I, you know, I want to think that there's something natural and that's what I think, you know, I mean, could they have been peaked and tweaked genetically by somebody or something or whatever? Absolutely. But, uh, I, I just feel like they're very old. I feel like they're very ancient, you know, that's just what I feel like. I mean, they're kind of distributed all over the United States and, you know, I think any place that will support them. Yeah, it's it's a fair answer, Steve. I mean, no one really knows, and that's really why I love that question, because there really is no wrong answer. And you get a lot of very thought-provoking answers to that question. Uh, hopefully, one day we'll know, you know, what these things are. And, um, you know, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on and, and share what happened to you. Uh, I enjoyed the, the encounter when you were 10. I enjoyed hearing, you know, what happened to you when you were hunting. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I enjoyed talking with you. Absolutely. I'm glad I got to come on here and share my experience and uh, become part of the family now. 